by six o'clock. First thing on the agenda is additions and deletions. Uh, I would like to add executive session to the end of the meeting, if possible. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, that's all I have. Okay. Citizens' comments. No citizens' comments. Okay. The Woodstock Aqueduct Working Committee presentation. Uh, so before we hop in there, I think we just want to make sure people know um, when you have a comment, uh, we have the podium set up with a microphone. Uh, so please go to the podium, state your name, uh, your address. Uh, do we want to have a time limit for comments? Yeah, we'll go three minutes. Three minutes or three minutes. I'll try to stop you. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be, me and Nikki will be monitoring Zoom. So we'll try to go back and forth between in person uh, to make sure we're equitable for everyone. Um, <clears throat> Before we turn over to Charlie Kimball, I just want to give some background on the committee uh, that's going to give the recommendations in a minute. Uh, so after the flood uh, this past summer, um, there's a lot of interest in the community about the uh, Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, based on that interest, there was a public forum held here at uh, end of August. Um, based on a lot of questions that got asked um, and Limited resources we have at a municipality. Um, Charlie Kimball came in front of the select board asking to form a working group to look into some of those questions the public had. Um, he formed a committee of uh, some residents, very uh, diverse and intellectually uh, gifted uh, committee, I, I should say. It was uh, I was in awe sometimes listening to them talk about their thoughts and ideas as we went through this process. Uh, the committee met uh, almost once a week for three months. Um, going through all these questions, challenges, scenarios. Uh, beyond that, a lot of them were working on their free time weekends during the day. Um, <clears throat> Charlie worked with me a lot on working with the state, try to find grants for this as well. Um, so before we go forward, I just want to thank the committee for all the work they did over the last few months. Um, without them, we would not be here. We don't have the information we have. Uh, so I just want to really express my gratitude for all the work and time they gave up uh, on this project. Thank you. So that's it, Charlie. It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the select board. I regret that I'm not there in person, but COVID still is among us, and that is why I am not among you. Um, but want to thank you for the opportunity to present what we found as a working group. And as Eric mentioned, we started working in October of this past fall following the public comments or public hearing on August 31st. So we had already sent to the select board a letter dated December 8th, and then included in that were attachments uh, with a potential deal sheet, a 90% preliminary engineering report from Otter Creek Engineering, the Harvard Business School study, uh, questions from the working group in public, which we had tried to answer, uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company talking points, uh, some benchmarking dated 12-5, uh, a 10-year capital plan, and a financing cost comparison. So all of that had been submitted in December. I'll try not to repeat any of that. Um, if we can jump into the PowerPoint, Nikki, can you uh, pull that up and share it, or do you want me to do that? You can go ahead, and you should be able to sh uh, share as well. Well. Cool. Okay, so you should be seeing it now. It says Woodstock, Vermont, Charter 1761. Do you see that? Yep, yep. Okay, terrific. So we already know that part. As uh, Eric was describing the members of the committee, these are the members that served on the committee. I, I do want to thank them as well. It was oftentimes a very engaging discussion um, as we considered all the different aspects uh, we had representatives from the select board, from the trustees, from the finance committee, and also from the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, our objective, let's see if I can just, ooh, no, sorry. Our objective was pretty simple, kind of, uh, was to evaluate the financial management and governance implications that the town would acquire the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Um, and there were a lot of different layers to that. 
So with each one, we uncovered a new layer that we had to then further discuss. But we committed a lot of outreach. Um, we contacted uh, outside groups as well as inside groups, inside meeting who are currently involved with the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Uh, you can see this list, uh, a lot of that was done uh, as a group, but also individually and trying to get some expertise to answer some of the questions that were raised at that public forum and also ones that we raised ourselves saying, well, can the town actually do this and what are the implications? We also conducted a little more research and diving into the reports that were available, whether it was the Otter Creek engineering report. We met twice with uh, the principal engineer that had written the report. Also, there is data available uh, from the University of North Carolina on water rates throughout the state of Vermont. And also looking at the financial statements for the Woodstock Aqueduct Company and various billing statements for usage and also billing. It took a while uh, to actually compile all this information and get into a format that made sense to us. And then also the Harvard Business School report, which uh, you have and the students did a great job of really framing uh, the things to be considered. And then uh, the recommendation was that it's in the best interest of the town to uh, purchase and operate the Woodstock Aqueduct, Com Aqueduct Company. Uh, and we try to support that by basically saying three different things. One is these improvements have to be made in order to satisfy the regulators. Uh, two, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company is no longer in a position to make those improvements. And three, uh, if there is an owner, the owner would either be a private owner or it would be the municipality and that it was in the best interest of the town to be the owner of the aqueduct company. So broken out a little more in terms of water security, uh, being able to control the water source for the municipality is key for the future of the community itself. Uh, looking at public safety. Uh, the fire hydrants, there are 96 of them on the system, and they do provide uh, fire safety for the village and also areas outside of the village. For economic development, I first became interested in the subject because of uh, a developer was expressing frustration that they could not get permits for water in order to do some infill development in the East End. Um, that was the thing that spurred me on, but also uh, since then there have been cases where owners of properties that have not been able to get extensions uh, for the water permits or for a water connection. So they've had to drill their own wells. Uh, and have control over the operations of the system and determine who, who pays. Uh, currently, with a, even though it's a, regulated by the Public Utilities Commission, it's really in the hands of a private owner. And to get the lowest cost for rate payers in the town, the town has advantages over a private owner uh, in the terms of access to low cost capital, they can get loans of zero to three percent, whereas a private investor is going to be north of seven or eight percent. Uh, also, access to grants, uh, federal and state grants. And we found that when we we're trying to chase down some other grants to help the town recover, uh, the town water system recover from the floods in July. Uh, Woodstock Aqueduct Company simply wasn't eligible for FEMA and other grant sources. Uh, alignment of strategic interests. Uh, it is not always a profitable venture to pursue the strategic interests of the town, whether it's development of a certain area of town or something in the public interest. Um, so to make sure that the town has control over that. And then to fold in the other operations of the town, it does make sense. And in our communications with other municipalities, we found that often water and sewer departments are combined. Uh, and we found that to be true in a few communities that we contacted in Vermont. Uh, they often have the same skill requirement in terms of maintaining systems, whether it's pipes and pumps. You have to make sure you know which end of the system is coming out of. And then the uh, question is, what's included in the deal? Um, and we were not in a position to really recommend a negotiating position for the select board. Uh, but do think that this is really a play for all of the assets of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. And their management has indicated that they are willing to transfer the assets of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company for the value of the debt, to assume the debt and not extra money on top of them. So that is what the deal kind of is, except that 
and the next owner is going to be obligated to make sure all the regulatory requirements are fulfilled. And the capital plan that we looked at over a 10 year period is about $10 million. Now that is a combination of grants, and debt, cash flow and everything else from the operation. So it doesn't mean it's $10 million in debt. Uh, so we don't know exactly what that number is because we don't know the availability of all the different grant sources or how much cash flow could actually be used from the operations to pay for those new investments. So what is the financial impact of purchasing the system? Well, for ratepayers, it's going to be a lower financial impact than if a private investor would own it. Um, but there are many variable factors, which I just mentioned most of these, um, but we don't yet know if all the projects that are currently identified in the preliminary engineering report would definitely have to be uh, completed. It could be that a couple, for instance, there's the proposal to uh, bring a larger pipe from the Cox District Reservoir down to Route 4 uh, and increase the size of the pipe from 8 inches to 12 inches. Well, that satisfies the water pressure at a lot of fire hydrants by itself. But then extending that 12-inch pipe from there, Route 4, all the way to the Rec Center Bridge also then has an impact of increasing water pressure at the fire hydrants. So the second or the third recommendation is to establish a, a reservoir or a tank on the east side of Woodstock. Uh, would that be necessary if you did the first two? It is currently the engineer's opinion that yes, it would be necessary. But if you did the first two, you might find that you've got enough pressure to satisfy the state requirements. We just don't know. Um, replacement of the existing water mains. Right now, there is not anything in the uh, proposed schedule to replace the water mains. Uh, there is a repair schedule in a financial model that we had presented to the Woodstock Finance Committee. And the Woodstock Finance Committee is really uh, taking that information and coming up with a more detailed financial model uh, for your use. Uh, and then the purchase price, what is it? What's included in it? Uh, and that's where we stop short of trying to provide you with you know, merging orders, because we don't have that authority and it's up to you as the select board to really negotiate that with the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. And then this is all subject to approval, the financing and also the operations of a water company by the Agency of Natural Resources. Uh, so there is state regulation still involved. The, the, one of the good things for the town is that the town has complete control over the rates it is not subject to regulation by the Public Utilities Committee. That is a difference between municipal ownership and town ownership. Then the question is determining who pays. This series of graphs, these pie charts, uh, show what our analysis showed as to what percent of customers are made up by residences, what are commercial hospitality and institutions. Now, there's a disclaimer. This information is not currently in the database of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. This was going through customer by customer to determine if what category they fell into. So it is for illustrative purposes only. Uh, so we wanted to show you how that breaks down. The second part is what percent of those customers actually use the water. You can see the residences, while they comprise 77% of all users, it is 49% of the water being used. And those same residences then use 58% of, uh, or they pay 58% of the total amount of fees paid. Hospitality sector you can see is only 5.5%, but 32.5% of water usage and 18%. So it raises a lot of questions when you're looking at the rate schedule as to should it reflect who uh, who pays? Should that also be the same people who pay for the water usage or who uses the most should pay the most? So by category, it's a question I think that is reasonable to ask. Uh, we said that the rate card really should be reviewed. Uh, we didn't have enough time to fully dive into it. And it's a really involved process to try to figure out what the right rate schedule is. 
And there are consultants that do this for a full-time job. So next is where's Woodstock sit among Vermont? Uh, one of the members, Alex Molly, put this scatter chart together uh, as to evaluate where Woodstock is. It's in the range. It's in the normalcy of the range of water rates for Vermont. It's at the lower end, um, but this chart on the x-axis uh, shows a monthly fee, which is about $33, $35 a month. Um, obviously, Woodstock charges on a quarterly basis and an annual charge is somewhere between $300 and $315 a year for the, for the median water user, a typical water user in Woodstock. Um, but so there's as many dots on the right that are blue, solid blue, as there are on the left. So that gives you an idea of we're somewhere in the middle as to what Woodstock charges. The X, the Y axis, that's the one that goes up, is what percent of area median income is that water rate? And that is below 0.5%. And best practices say that you should be below 1%. Well, Woodstock is below 1%. So that would seem to indicate that there's room for a higher rates to pay for improvements. But uh, you have to be careful with that uh, when you're looking at people that are already struggling to pay their water bills or their bills. So then the question is who pays? And this becomes a central question. Um, right now, the current rate schedule basically breaks down into four things. There's high current fees, which remember there are 96, 85 of them are owned by the town, uh, including the town fire hydrant system and also the sewer plant. Uh, the others are the schools um, and Billings Farm and the National Park. Capacity fees, which is basically the size of the pipe that's connected under the mains. Uh, so there are some users that have higher capacities that have to be met. Base fees, every unit is charged a base fee. And I say unit because there are some buildings that have one connection to three units. And so they're charged for the units. Um, and so that is something to kind of suss out a little bit. And then consumption charges, and that is the rates that users pay for the consumption of water above what their minimum is on a quarterly basis, which is 300 cubic feet per quarter. Um, and that consumption rate is uniform across all users. Uh, it's about 2.9 cents per cubic foot. Um, and that is the same for the highest user as it is for the smallest user. So it's important to note that there are some different philosophies within water utilities as to what to charge. Uh, should it be higher for a higher dollar amount used or higher volume used uh, or lower? Uh, we found in looking around uh, New England and looking around Vermont, there are many different forms of rates that are charged. Uh, and that there are some similar to the Woodstock Aqueduct Company, but there are others that are much different depending on what you want to achieve. So there's option A, keep the existing rate schedule as it is. Um, and then you can adjust the components within that rate schedule to meet the increased cost of borrowing the money to uh, fund the improvements. So if you uh, increase your base fees for every unit, that would raise X amount of dollars. And if you increased the amount of the consumption rate, then that would charge generate another bit of dollars. And then also the hydrant fees. So the Woodstock Aqueduct Company is currently in the process of applying for an increase in its rates to the Public Utilities Commission uh, in case the town does not want to buy uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company so it can afford to make the improvements that are being required of it by the state regulators. And that is gonna see a dramatic increase in the amount charged to the hydrants. Right now, all hydrants, the revenue is about 37,000, the town's paying under 30, but that would increase significantly to approximately $500,000. So that would be a town fee, not on rate pairs. So you could keep the existing rate schedule. The other option is to create an entirely new rate schedule. And that is to have a deliberative process about what kind of things you're trying to achieve with a rate schedule. Uh, and this is, we did not get into this. 
um, as our committee. Uh, and But we noted that it is something that is complex and that that should be addressed regardless of who owns it. Uh, and there are, there are grants available to fund those. And, to, and speaking with the town manager of Wilmington, uh, he mentioned when they went through the acquisition of a private water company, they did hire a consultant offered to them uh, by the Agency of Natural Resources, and that helped considerably. So that um, certainly, I, I know that you have a lot of questions, and this is just a recap of where we were. I didn't want to take too much time, but open it up so that we could try. There are other members of the committee that are here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that maybe we could address some of those if uh, if need be. Are there any questions from the SEC board? No. I had a question, Charlie. Um, sorry, my voice. Um, um, I know in the different reports and literature, um, you guys spoke um, to maybe one other town or a few other towns that have acquired a private company. And I'm just wondering what the like average timeline for a transaction like that looked like. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, the two towns that I can tell you about are uh, Arlington and also Wilmington. Uh, Wilmington is a separation of its private water company um, from the town. It was a bit of a, I think it was a fire district that ended up being formed when the village and town merged uh, years ago. That's a totally different subject altogether. But anyway, so Wilmington had gone through that process and orphaned was the water company. So the water company operated separately, then they took a process, it was about a year, where the town took over operating its uh, finances and its books, and then owned it after that. Uh, Arlington, um, and I think Eric may know better, but they started it, I think it was about a year long process um, in terms of the establishing discussions, uh, coming to an agreed upon price with the owner, uh, going to the town voters in a special meeting, passing a bond article, and the bond article was for $4 million to purchase the water system in Arlington. It's less than half the size of Woodstock. Uh, 1.6 million of that was for the purchase, and the balance was for improvements to be made to the system. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Roger, come up. Roger Logan, Woodstock, water user, I guess. Um, the more I hear about this, the more it seems to me that there's only one right choice, and that right choice is to go ahead and purchase the water system. Um, I, Charlie and, and the committee have done a great job of laying out the different financial aspects of this, and I don't see any way that it doesn't end up ultimately being less expensive both for taxpayers and for ratepayers, to go with, with Woodstock purchasing it as important. And, and as Charlie pointed out, this gives us the chance to align the strategic interests of the town with, with the operations of the water company in a way that a for-profit owner is not necessarily going to do. Um, right now, the fact that a new home or a new business cannot connect is obviously severely crippling our ability to grow and diversify our economy. So I don't see, I, I again, I urge you to look, do your due diligence and look into this, obviously, but from what I've seen, and I've watched this presentation several times now, I, I just don't think that there's really any other choice besides going ahead and buying it. Thanks. Anyone on Zoom? No one yet, I see. Hey, John? I'm John Spector, 16 The Green, apparently you wanted our addresses. Um, and I'm here as the reporting for the Finance Committee. Um, our role this year is, as you may recall from prior discussions, is not to spend line by line with the budget, but at the request of the town uh, municipal manager to uh, focus on a handful of strategic issues, one of which is the purchase of the aqueduct company. Um, now that that work is there, the working group's work is finished, we can begin our work of 
of assessing it and coming to a point of view and advising you and the trustees. Um, we've held two meetings with members of the uh, water working group, and one of which was today. And at today's meeting, we came to three conclusions and therefore passed a motion to recommend some action to you. Um, the first conclusion we came to is that it appears that there is, not appears, there is, I think in our view, well-researched analyses and arguments for why it's better for the town to purchase. Uh, and so we recommend putting the decision to purchase the water company on the ballot because that decision has to be made, my understanding is, in the next 10 days. We did not, we're not yet recommending whether or not we should purchase the water company, but if it isn't on the ballot, we can't, at least in March, decide to purchase it. So we're recommend, there's enough positive indication based on the things you've heard Charlie say, the things you heard Roger say and others, that we think it should be on the ballot. The second conclusion we reached is that there are enough questions from members of the community, including members of the finance committee, who would like to see the, the numbers and the assumptions behind the statements that you've heard Charlie make and the group make, um, that it is, much, it is less expensive. Here are the different areas in which it's less expensive. Here's what the cost would be of managing it. Here's what the taxes would be and so forth. And so we, the second, so the second part of our motion was to, to commit to the select board that we will do due diligence on the financial model. Um, we are very confident we can do that. We can begin it right away because we've sh they've, sh they've shared their data with us. We have a working version of their model that we would like to make some enhancements to it, but build on the same model they have. So we're very confident we can do the work and come to a recommendation by the, by before before town meeting. Um, and we think that the public, we, we can just observe that people in the absence of information want to note that. The third conclusion we came to is that there's not yet agreement on whether or not we should be talking about who pays before we make the decision to purchase or not purchase. And so we have committed to, to say that we may or may not conduct an analysis of who pays. We are capable of conducting that analysis, we have significant data to do that. That data is also very preliminary and will is likely not 100% accurate as Charlie indicated. And so there are sort of pros and cons of doing that analysis. So our specific recommendation is that you put it on the ballot. That does not mean that we support it or are opposed to it. We will conduct due diligence over the next few months and we'll report back to you our conclusions. And at that time, I expect we will have a recommendation based on the financial aspects. Thank you. Is, there, is that an accurate? Oops. Eric, can I ask a question? Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Um, I just want to make sure I'm hearing John correctly um, because I think I I don't um, I think there's probably just like a few questions as to how something like this gets discussed and done versus like what what the move is, and so I guess my question for the finance committee and John is. Uh, I just want to make sure I have it right that their recommendation is that we that we put an article forth on the ballot um, to say whether or not we want the town to purchase the company, not necessarily to say like we want the town to purchase this company or what for. So more of of like an intention and a memorandum of understanding than like uh, we want the town to purchase this for this amount bonded for. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm. Yeah, I I think. The, you know, I don't think we would not, well, this is new ground, but I don't yeah. think we see it as our role to advise on negotiating strategy or, or anything of that sort. Um, or I think what we see as our role is to basically answer the question in a variety of assumptions that are all reasonable. Do most or all of the scenarios suggest that it is better for the town, financially better for the town to own, for, to own the company than for a private entity. I suppose if the town negotiated an absurdly high price, it would be better to, to not have the town own it, but assuming rational. So I think what we'll focus on is checking and doing due diligence on the financial out possibilities and assumptions and helping to make that public so that people will see that it's not just Charlie 
with a PowerPoint presentation that's well written, but there's an enormous amount of work that went behind it, and the financial assumptions and so forth, you know, are important. I think for people to understand so that they can make a, an informed decision. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the question that I I have personally as a board member is like where the due diligence happens and when the due diligence happens and whether or not we put this forward as a board for a March vote, having not have an independent financial audit, having not had an independent engineering report, um, and like a lot of other things. And, you know, do we put that forward to the voters and say, like, we're assuming a lot? Or do we say, like, we no. intend, we no. all agree that we, Might as well stay, Might as well stay there. Um, that we all agree that this is uh, a good idea and aligns with the values of the town, but we need to do due diligence on it. So we're not going to put it in front of the voters until we have can come back with due diligence. I don't know. Yeah, this so, question is for everybody. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the finance committee uh, can make their recommendation. Uh, the select board obviously doesn't have to follow it. Um, but I think to Laura's point, what the board wants to do going forward will be a discussion of, of, among the board to sort of lay out how this could work going forward, whether they want to pursue purchase and what that means, a timeline for assessment, independent studies. Uh, if they're not interested in a purchase, it just kind of dies on the table. Uh, so I think that it's on the board now to make their decision how they want to proceed going forward and then what that will look like uh, at, at that point. Yeah. A, a brief comment, Laura. I, the, I just want to be clear what the finance committee, because I think it touched what, what we intended. Um, we are under the impression, we were under the impression in the meeting that if we don't put it on the ballot for March, we cannot buy it, or at least we cannot buy it in March. And there is some sense of urgency. I don't know what that sense of urgency is. And so we don't know whether or not the town should buy it or not. I mean, I have my own personal view. It's similar to Rogers and so forth. I've seen all the analysis and so forth. I think it's very compelling. But we thought we can't just say, well, John likes it, so you know that's that's good enough. So we want to conduct due diligence and we will come back with a recommendation as to okay. whether or not we think we should buy it. If the recommendation is you shouldn't buy it, then the select board can stand up and it's on the ballot. We don't recommend it. If it is that you buy it, I'm I believe it's it's certain, like this is your the select board's role, that they will not then go out and buy it. They will then negotiate to buy it, and all the things you talked about would determine whether or not they bought it or not. But what we're doing, what we're suggesting is simply that you leave the option open by putting it on the ballot. If that's not the way it works, then you can ignore the recommendation. Am I, yeah. Yeah. Am I correct that this is more for Eric? So yeah, so I'll, stand I'll, down. Sorry. That we don't have to necessarily have the voters approval to start to hire whoever we need to hire to start negotiations. Right. Because my concern is we put it on the ballot as a as a voter, not even as a select board member. I don't know what we're buying. I don't know what the purchase price is. I don't know who's paying it. And I think it's premature to have it on the ballot in March. That doesn't mean we can't proceed with negotiating due diligence, forensic accounting if we if we think that's necessary. And then once we know, then we can actually bring something to the voters as an entire package rather than a we want your sentiment on on an unknown. Yeah. So the board can. So we had an executive session to the agenda, uh, so we can talk about potential uh, real estate purchases, you know, in, in more detail uh, that won't hurt the town in any negotiations in the future. So some of these details we may want to leave, you know, till then. Um, but the town can direct someone to enter negotiations uh, if, if they so choose. Um, and work through a lot of these issues that Susan and Laura brought up. And then whenever those discussions have come to fruition, whether it's in March and it's on a ballot or whether it's a special town meeting going forward, uh, that can happen as well. Yeah, Jeffrey Kahn, a uh, village resident. Um, you just answered one of my questions, sort of. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of work that's been done by Charlie and his committee, and, and I applaud that. Uh, it's wonderful. And, and also the finance committee and the work that they're willing to do. Those are both two wonderful assets for, for the town. Uh, that's great. But we shouldn't rush it because it can be voted on at a special meeting, which, as you just said, uh, it doesn't have to be a town meeting. Um, and I think it's important to 
to remember that. I do have one question for Charlie to be clear. I saw that line about um, it includes property owned by uh, the uh, aqueduct company. Does it include all of the property owned by the aqueduct company up by the reservoir as well as uh, off of Route 12, that area? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Jeff. Um, the original idea of the Woodstock Aqueduct Company and offering the property for sale was to offer all of the different parcels, the uh, wells that are up on Route 12, um, also along Steinmetz Road at the bottom of Barbary Hill, um, the shop and the storage tank and everything to the west side of Cox District Road, but not to convey the uh, Vondell property to the east of Cox District Road. Um, and that is, uh, I know that they, uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company would love to have the future use of the Vondell Reservoir reserved for recreational purposes going forward. It's not like they want to sell it to a, um, a developer uh, to then locate a you know, 100 unit development there. Uh, but th th that is where there is some negotiation that has to occur between the select board and um, the, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. So, but all of the different property that is important, that is necessary for the operations of uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company, what are, would be included. Our recommendation was to uh, acquire all of the assets, including the Vondell. That was our recommendation. Thank you, thank you. It's my recommendation too, include the reservoir. Thank you. I have a question. Um, would that include the solar panels? Yes. Um, that right. The solar panels were put in in 2017, I believe, um, and that would be included in that. And that has reduced their electricity bill significantly from, I want to say, twenty thousand dollars a year to about seven or eight thousand dollars a year. Um, so it's been a very smart investment uh, for the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. Thank you. Jill. Jill Davis, a village resident. Um, I want to speak to something that you brought up about the, the timing of this decision. Um, it's lovely to think that you have all the time in the world to make a decision, but the truth of the matter is we have a public utility, well, what could be a public utility, owned by a private company that is not putting any investment money into the system. And what that is doing is stopping houses being built. So right now, Mellish Woods can't get permission to put in another 13 units that we desperately need. Safford Commons can't get permission to put in four houses to buy with federal and state money that makes them a bargain. Those permits cannot be given. Without those permits, we can't get federal and state monies. So there is an urgency to find out whether we want to buy this company or not. And then to do all of our due diligence properly after that. But if we don't put it on the ballot, we can kick it down the road again and again and again and again. And we do know that in March, most people will come out and vote who are going to vote. Just look at the number of people here. It's not very many for a major decision. And I suspect that a special vote will not garner the same interest as a March decision will. Thank you. I, I know, Wendy, you have a hand if you want to come speak, and then we'll go to someone on Zoom. Wendy Marin and Village Resident. Uh, my question uh, was partially addressed by Jeffrey in terms of the real estate. It's a question for Charlie and the committee. Um, what aspect of property taxes would the town, if any, lose by having the, these parcels of real estate owned by the town? Is that, did I ask that yeah. clearly? You did, yeah. And according to our analysis of the financial statements, I think it's thirty-three thousand dollars that are paid by the Woodstock Aqueduct Company and property taxes that you would then not have. Um, there are also fees that the town pays to the Woodstock Aqueduct Company that the town would not have to pay. So there's some offsets. For instance, the town pays the aqueduct company for their meter readings to help calculate the sewer bills. Um, so are, there are some of those, and in the financial model, 
uh, that those are kind of netted out to show, okay, here is the net impact. Um, it does require some thought about where is that, which fund that occurs in, uh, inside of town government and where it doesn't occur. So we, we weren't trying to tie all that together. We don't have that expertise. Um, we were just trying to um, really accommodate what the change would be with the funding specifically for the water company. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, online, uh, I'm not sure. MS has his hand up. Yeah, hi, it's Michael Sargent. Sorry, I couldn't change my initials to my name. Um, just two questions. Uh, in terms of what we'll be putting on the town ballot on March if we proceeded, is it the, are we authorizing the town to enter into negotiations? Are we authorizing a capped purchase price? Or are we authorizing what ultimately will be as much as a $10 million set of obligations that the town will be taking on? Because it, it's not clear to me how we have a path to success if we can't explain to the tax payers and rate payers what they are approving. And I, I do want to say that I agree that we are likely the best owner of this asset. But if if that seems to be the consensus view, then shouldn't we wait until we have the best possible information to inform our voters so that they align with the sentiments that have been voiced here in this meeting? Uh, Mr. Chair, can I take a stab at that? Yeah. So, Michael, you're absolutely right. And I think Susan mentioned it earlier. Um, uh, with my limited knowledge of state law, you, the town does not have to have a vote to, in order to negotiate purchase price or contracts, but it can't actually pay for anything unless the voters approve it. So, you know, typically, that town vote would be for the budgeted amount in order to make the purchase happen. Um, and then those anticipated expenses that you would incur in the first excellent number of years. Uh, so that, you're right, is usually tied into a money amount, a uh, bond amount. Um, so um, it, it could be that uh, our, if, if something appears on the ballot, what usually appears uh, is for the dollar amount. We authorize the select board to spend X number of dollars, but not for the purchase, because they can do that on their own. So given all of the unknowns that due diligence is bound to expose, and, and the committee's done a great job disclosing some of those already, right? A third of the water is lost, uh, is unaccounted for in this system, right? So we know there are a lot of issues with this company that have not been fully vetted yet. Are we confident that when you put whatever dollar amount you're going to put on that ballot, it's going to meet the needs that we're going, the town's going to be inheriting? And that the share and that the, the voters are going to be comfortable that we know enough to vote affirmatively and proceed. Because I, you know, you get one shot at these things. I think most of us know that, right? If you go prematurely with incomplete or really poor information, is despite what Jill says, yes, there's urgency, but urgency that leads to failure is not a great outcome. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't know if all of you know me. My name is Roy Bates. I was an eight-year selectman, and in 70 years ago, I worked for the Woodstock Fast Product Company Summers when I was in high school. That's not important to this meeting, but I've been around a long time on an old F. You know what that means? Sometimes I stumble when I talk, sometimes I do okay. But I don't want to labor much here. Uh, I, will, I really think we should make sure who does the aqueduct company own Vondell? Yeah. Or who owns Vondell? The building's estate or who? Uh, the other thing about that is when I first worked for the aqueduct company, we had Poghole hitched in. We had the Carlton Hill Reservoir hitched in, and we had the reservoir up on the Cox District Road beyond the water tower hotel. Now, the status of running out of water, we can't connect, is that my understanding, to the that uh, pond and up on, college, on uh, Cox District Road 
because that was the overflow that would have fed the town when we were out of water. Now that line used to run down to the foot of Carlton Hill and met the Carlton Hill Reservoir in a storage tank. And then when we got low on water, we could hook either one in or whatever we needed to do. Uh, but uh, I don't know if that's a viable option. I don't know if that pipe still goes under the river or not. Anyways, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is if we're buying this, which we have to do or assume it, I guess, or sure, or get it from the state if they have to take it over. Now, when I was on the select board, we tried to get a merger. We had three things we were working on. We tried to get the merger. We had something going on with the grade school, and we were also going to buy A and B Motors, yep. and uh, that was going to be a lot or playground for the school. And we brought too many issues to the taxpayers, and they all went down. The merger by seven votes, but you get too much out there asking for too many taxes in the assets. What's the EDC going to do? For people to live, if we up our taxes thirty percent and prove these three items, something has to be go away. Now the other thing is, thirty percent is too high, and I would like to recommend, but I'm going to get cut out of this probably. But I think that school should delay three years, should vote it down, and get these other couple of things out of the way first. Try to save some more money for that school and then go for that. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good evening. My name is Kevin Lynch. Um, it looks like Aqueduct, to be honest and truly, has received me the amount of holes being dug around town. The infrastructure is in dire straits. We've known that for years. So I'm going to throw out a radical idea. How about the Billings family, who's ever in charge, donates the Woodstock Aqueduct to the town, not ask us to pay? Because I think down the road, we're going to be spending a lot of money to upgrade this system and make it functional. As I listen to different stories here about water's not being able to get here, water's not getting to there. So I think maybe that's an approach we might take. Ask them to donate it to the town, because there's going to be a big expense to make this functioning. I don't know. I think the taxpayers really want to take that on with all the other things that are going on or being asked about. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Seth Westbrook. I'm a Pomfret resident, but I'm a, the co-founder and uh, board member for Woodstock Area Mountain Bike Association. We're uh, about a four, just over 400 member organization locally. We manage the trail system on the aqueduct property on the Vondell parcel. Uh, it's about a 14 mile trail system at this point uh, that we've put in. Starting, there, the trails have been there historically and the company has been supportive of recreation. Um, we started in 2015, 2016, really doing it formally uh, with an operating agreement, uh, getting grants. We've had uh, support from the EDC. Uh, it's a really important parcel for the town in terms of recreation and community access. Uh, the, the kids teams on the in the high school and middle school and youth programs use it. Um, uh, a lot of people come here to use the trail system. A lot of people in the community use it. So um, I would just be supportive of continuing that re relationship of public access and recreation going forward on the Bondell. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Chair, could I just make one last comment? No, okay. uh, Tom's coming up. Okay. Tom, yep. Tom, go ahead. Come on no up, problem. Tom. Tom, never mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a few things. And um, a number of people know this already. Um, I uh, did serve with the working group, and it was fascinating. And the group did a very good and thorough job. Um, I also inherited two shares of aqueduct stock from my father, and I sit on the board. So I served on the working group until the very last meeting and then abstained when it came to voting for a recommendation and have since 
stepped off because I think the next step will probably be negotiations and I wouldn't have a huge conflict, <laughs> <laughs> the conflict. Um, but there are some things um, maybe a little bit historical um, people should know. Um, uh, one of which is um, the company is right from the start been operated essentially as a nonprofit. I mean, Frederick Billings had done very well in real estate in San Francisco in 1848 and 49, and then went on and was president of the Northern Pacific Railroad, uh, which also made money from real estate because back then the, the railroad grants meant the company got every other section of land from wherever Northern Pacific started, maybe Chicago to the West Coast on a 20 mile right away. Um, then he returned home to Woodstock and in um, roughly 1890, early 1890s, I believe, put in $100,000 um, when the town turned down uh, the idea of creating a water company. And the family uh, still owns um, by far the most shares. There are no more shares now than there were then. There are 2,000 shares. And the uh, and Frederick Billings' descendants do own it, or the vast majority of it. I, I think there's 30 shareholders, but um, most of them are more or less like me and have a few shares. Um, and so uh, all that time, 100, 30 years, whatever it is, um, the company's goal has been to provide potable water um, at as reasonable a price as it can. And there's been a lot, honestly, have been a fair amount of misinformation out about shareholders, um, you know, pocketing money and so on, which is not accurate. Um, and also um, talk about how, how much work um, the infrastructure needs. And it's not to say that it, there isn't work um, to be done, but there's also been a lot of work done recently. Oh, I'm sorry, sure. Um, uh, and and so thinking about things being donated, what the aqueduct company, um, uh, when they approached the town, uh, the idea was, not to basically not to charge anything for the old stuff, but um, to have, come up with a price to uh, pay for the things that have been done recently. And the most recent was completed in 2017, which was what was called the West Loop, which created an additional eight inch main connecting the water tank to the village. And the total cost of that was just under five hundred thousand um, dollars. I'm going to ask you to finish up because we've got a lot. I'm sorry. I'll, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, move quickly. Um, the, the other thing that's come up uh, is the Vondel, um, and the original proposal the Aqueduct Company put forward was to retain the Vondel um, until. The mortgage was paid off by selling the infrastructure with the aim of putting deed restrictions on the Vondel, uh, including um, easements for the water, for the uh, uh, bike uh, association. Um, and, and, and the reason it came at that time was that it became apparent to the aqueduct company with the new regulations and the new engineering report about water pressure for the hydrants that there was no way the aqueduct company could do that as cheaply as the town. Okay, thank you. We're gonna, gonna move on. Thank That's you. of course, no. Thanks. Thank you. Charlie, do you wanna finish up? I think uh, Tom actually covered the history, which I was hoping to uh, then add in, but did a very admirable job. Uh, I just do wanna say the rumor about wooden pipes precedes predates the Woodstock Aqueduct Company. That was in the 1820s. And you will find some wooden pipes in the village, but that was a water system that was established in the early 1800s. Thank you, Charlie.
Town meeting day. What, Matt? I think uh, last meeting it got brought up um, about whether the town wanted to use uh, the state regulations for COVID uh, to have this town meeting coming up in March uh, be all Australian ballots. Uh, the thought at the time was the board wanted to get input by the residents. Uh, I think by seeing people in the conference room today and online, there is going to be some feedback. Um, so I don't know if the board wants to talk about among themselves first or open it up for feedback from the public. Um, Eric, I have a document that I can share also. Yep. If that's... Okay. Yep. Let me share my screen. Can everybody see everything and can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so as Eric mentioned, this has come up. Um, we discussed this at our last meeting um, as uh, we had a few people approach the board to ask what our options were for voting on town meeting day. So I compiled a lot of information to explore what our options are. So I'm going to go through this for some of you. It's old hat. Um, pretend like you're learning it for the first time ever. Um, and uh, yeah, we love your feedback. So for those of you who don't know, um, what we currently do is we vote across two days and two different mediums. We vote um, by voice at town meeting at town hall on Saturday, and we vote for the budget and special articles that way. And then we vote by Australian ballot on Tuesday, which is like town meeting day in Vermont, um, the day schools have off. And we vote for petitioned articles and bond articles um, via Australian ballot. Um, just so you know, because I wasn't aware before this process, special articles are articles put forth by the select board and are voted on Saturday. Petitioned articles are those that are petitioned by citizens um, and get the required signatures. And those are voted by uh, Australian ballot. Um, some history of how we've changed town meeting day in the past in Woodstock is that um, before 1958, we didn't vote officers by ballot, um, by Australian ballot, I should say. Um, and we moved to make that change in 1958. We moved to change petitioned articles uh, by Australian ballot in 1982. And then we moved to hold town meeting on Saturday instead of Tuesday in 1993. Um, so, uh, what Eric had mentioned is that we have the unique option this year to apply act one, um, which is a COVID measure that extends through June of next year, um, to apply Australian ballot to the whole ballot. Um, we, um, cannot use act one to permanently change town meeting day, um, because it needs to come from the standard mechanism of voting according to our council. Um, some other really important information that I learned during this process um, is that bond votes are required by Vermont statute to be voted on um, by Australian ballot. Um, we also have a presidential primary happening this year, so we will be voting on that via Australian ballot also on Tuesday. Um, and we are also required to hold an informational hearing within 10 days of the um, Australian ballot vote. Um, two other towns, Pomfret and Reading, you, in our district use Australian ballot. Um, if you recall, Pomfret just moved to Australian ballot this past year. Both towns um, had this conversation when they saw less than 10% turnout at their um, town meetings. We saw less than 3% turnout um, at our last Saturday town meeting last year. So um, that's something to keep in mind. So what are the actual options? Let's get to that. Um, if we want to change it, we can use Act 1 to apply Australian ballot to town meeting. If um, we don't want it to change this year, we can follow the current ordinance and vote two days across two days. Um, if we wanted it to stay unchanged or if we wanted to change it moving forward, we could keep it the same this year um, and apply a special article. Um, to um, change it moving forward so that it's voted on um, by voice uh, on the floor on Saturday. So, yep. And then if we wanted to change, or 
if we wanted to move it forward, um, do it moving forward without that option, we could have a special meeting later in the year, the way Pomfret did last year, um, to apply Australian ballot. Um, so yeah, I've um, I've had lots of conversations with a lot of people over the past two weeks about this, um, but I would love to hear more feedback or have if the board has questions first and then um, feedback from from our lovely constituents. Um, I, I don't have questions. I guess I just have some concerns. Um, first, I'm just being the self-proclaimed process geek of the board. I'm a little concerned with using what is was um, designated kind of as an emergency provision for COVID to change something when we've successfully had town meeting. Granted, last year was not great, but living in South Woodstock, if I had not spent the night at someone's house in the village, I wouldn't have been there because there was a pretty bad snowstorm, as we all remember. I'm also concerned about the timing, the present timing of our information meeting being the Saturday directly before the Tuesday. I, Charlie is here and can probably tell us the percentage of people that now vote absentee, but my guess is most people will vote before we even have our information meeting. So I think if we're going to consider this in future years, we at a minimum have to move that information meeting up. Maybe, you know, I wanna have informed voters. I wanna encourage people to vote, but I also want them to be informed. And with them, but with a lot of people voting absentee before we even have our Saturday meeting, they're not necessarily getting all the information they may need. So that's just my two cents. Uh, Jeffrey Kahn, Village Resident. Um, I concur that last year was unusual uh, in, in terms of the numbers that showed up, and I think it was weather dependent, but I have a suggestion that if we do things as in the past, at least for this year, that we make more of an effort to let people know this is under consideration um, and that um, uh, urge them if they want to consider to continue what was a successful democratic way of voting in this small town um, that they should show up and see and see if we get a better turnout than we did last year. Uh, I I I think that we we suffer the possibility if we go to straight Australian balloting and holding a separate informational meeting that that informational meeting will become smaller and smaller and smaller in attendance for both the reasons Susan said, as well as lack of interest in, well, you know, a lot was said, but, you know, I'm not going to vote till Tuesday. Um, there was one suggestion, I think Susan Fuller made it, which I did like, but uh, Eric said it may not be legal, which would be to have them all together. Informational meeting and then voting following. Um, try to get, because I agree, as many people informed as possible. But the back and forth that occurs, and I know people have changed their minds at the meeting when there have been a significant number of people there. Um, I think that's important and I think should be considered. Um, thank you. Um, if anyone has their hand up. Yeah, before we go, uh, Laura, are you able to unshare your screen just so I have a better view of who? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. And I, could I just address uh, a few of yeah. Jeffrey's concerns really quickly? So um, the informational meeting um, just needs to happen within 10 days of the vote. So it could happen the Saturday before the Saturday. That's my reading. Um, I think I think the things here, and and again, I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm I'm personally want to hear from more from more residents on this. I've heard from a lot of people, um, in both directions. Um, I think, you know, yeah, I I have thoughts, but I I think I just want to hear other other people in the room. If there are other people in the room that have thoughts on this before Roger, I share, Wendy? yeah, Roger. Um, I'm speaking as a longtime skeptic of the town meeting day. I think it's a lovely old tradition. I think it is no longer anywhere close to a representative sample of the population. 
Um, I agree last year was unusual because of the snowstorm, but the year before and the year before and the year before were also a fraction of the, pop the voting population of, of the town and the village. So I think it's a great idea to have an informational meeting to talk about sharing things and everything else, but town meeting is essentially unfair in many ways because it excludes people who might be working. It excludes people who might have childcare issues. It excludes a lot of people who simply cannot come and be there. Um, and I agree, the more people that can come and participate in the conversation, but the decision should be made by voting. Um, the, I mean, I'm, I feel very strongly about that, that if you want an inclusive representative number of voters making decisions for the town, continuing to do it in the same way that was invented in 1640 or whatever, um, is just not working anymore. Thanks. Wendy Marinin, village resident. Um, I, I came to the meeting specifically because I knew what I wanted to say in support of continuing town meeting in at least, very least the version we have now. But I want, in listening to people's points that have been made, I want to um, build on that. I agree with Susan Ford's point that an informed voter is the most important voter. And experientially, I value town meeting for the point that Jeffrey Kahn made, where the dialogue in the room with people that never see each other other than town meeting, but have made that time to come and talk about the issues can be decision altering. And uh, it's, I've never experienced that kind of revelation by reading the listserv or reading even a letter to an editor, as much as that it's more compelling to be in person. People have taken the time. So um, I respectfully disagree with Roger's points about this being a broken system. Uh, I think that we've split the gate over the years as Laura has outlined with the history by having the ballot, the Australian ballot, in addition to the floor vote, that's splitting the gate of people's time. It used to all happen in one. There are reasons that can be explained. The state is involved in some of those changes, I understand, over time. But I suggest if the town floor vote, town meeting day floor vote includes more <clears throat> controversial topics, above and beyond the budget, for example, should you put the 1% on the ballot or should you put some the water on the town meeting day ballot, you're gonna draw more people because of the invested concern that each person would bring to the meeting. Um, so that's, I, I am in support of keeping it the way it is. I'm in support of Susan Ford's point that we shouldn't invoke an emergency measure to change things this year. And I also respect Mr. Bates' point where you can't have too many decisions all at once or we can't make any. So thank you. I've got one thing to say about this. Uh, all my years in Woodstock, most of them, we just had a one day meeting and we voted them. It worked pretty good. But I have to say, I have one problem with the way town meeting is run. And that's a special article. They're a mess. And we tried to think about this. I don't remember if Jill remembers or not. But actually, I believe they should be petitioned to the select board. And anything under a certain dollar, point, dollar amount, the select board should have the authority to approve them or disapprove them, not put it before the voters. And you can uh, do this easily and put more money in your contingency fund to pay for some of these you want to approve. A couple of years ago, one item went through on the uh, special issues of $660,000, which was 15% of the budget that year. 
Now that never should have been on a special article. I don't know if we had to get a bond issue to pay for that. Does the select board know? We shouldn't be doing a bond issue for a special article. That should be a no-no. And uh, I, I think this could be handled this way and shorten your meeting immensely. And then you'd have uh, not such a detailed Australian ballot, only important issues. Thank you. Thank you. Arthur Einstein, village resident. I have since spoken to Laura on a number of occasions. And as far as I'm concerned, going to straight Australian ballot is a no brainer. According to the Secretary of State website, we had 3,066 visitors on the voter checklist. And I've spoken with Charlie about this. Maybe it's not that high. We have room in the auditorium downstairs for Laura said 368 people, if I remember correctly. Even if we had, what happens if all 3,000 people showed up? We can't even fit more than 10% in there. And it's not a democratic process. I won't say I'll go back as far as Roger, but this is not 1890 either. And people just can't be there. Even if you got 10%, that's not representative. And also there was an article in the newspaper which someone here was quoted as saying that people just show up without doing their homework. I don't think that's true because you can't read into people's mind what they do, how much research they might do on their own. And it's democracy. If they choose to vote on instinct because they want something or don't want something, we shouldn't say that they need to learn everything. They're entitled to vote the way they are. And the other thing I'm going to say is I'm not a public speaker. I hate this. Uh, I've been to town meetings. I'm trying to remember of the gentleman you guys might remember who was on the select board, and he was also the in charge of the town highway department. Who? Thank you. And I learned more than I need to know about culverts. And more, than, and more than most people need to know. I trust those guys to do their job. And I don't have to sit here for hours listening to that because they'll know it. And you know it too, obviously. I know from working on those things in your previous life, I don't need to listen to that. But you're disenfranchising a lot of people who have a right to vote whatever they want. And again, if you had a lot of people show up for controversially, I think also most of the votes now I don't, what are we deciding now by the floor vote, the town budget? Town budget, yeah. I mean, it seems like most things have been switched to Australian ballot for the most part. Yeah, so it's Laura went over earlier, it's, it's the budget, anything that the select board puts on will be floor, floor votes. Yeah, and, and, and the other words, I used to have a friend who did, I town meeting, I don't need to hear the same people pontificate, and that's what happens at the town meeting. Certain people are good speakers, they dominate it, and at two to three minutes apiece, you're not getting a give and take. It's It just needs to go to a more democratic process of Australian vote. And this is 2024 and it's not 1690 or 1890. And it was a nice, and we don't need to be like Dixville Notch. You know, we don't need to have the New York Times come up here and write articles about quaint, how quaint a system we have. It's not efficient. That's just my opinion. Right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Jill Davis, village resident. So I, like town meeting. I'm a, I would say I was a geek. I like coming to this meeting. I like learning about things. But most of the people who live in Woodstock don't. And I do actually believe in informed voters, and I don't think you should be voting on instinct. And so what I would like to suggest is that whether we have a town meeting or not, we completely overhaul our communication method and look at how we inform voters about what's going on. So we don't leave it to the Vermont standard to interpret things, but we actually published facts. So a lot of people have worked on the water company issue. Let's boil it down to a page. A lot of people, the 600,000 that was mentioned before was for um, changing the structure of our fire and ambulance department. And we, we wrote a paragraph about that. Well, let's, how about we think about how do you get information to voters so that you do get informed voters, whether they're voting on the floor or voting on Australian ballot? Thank you. Uh, there's no one online still. Online. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, Carol, do you have a comment? Carol Wood, I live in the town. 
I am a lifelong Vermonter. Uh, I grew up in Rutland City, so we didn't have town meeting. We had Sarah Ballady. Um, Kevin O'Connor from the Vermont Digger emailed the clerks in the state um, and asked them whether they were planning on doing the pre-COVID or now the furthest meeting coming up. And 125 clerks who responded said that they were all doing pre-COVID, which is having a town meeting and then the Australian balloting afterwards. We've given up, in my opinion, quite a bit. We don't vote on the school like we used to. And if we don't keep our control, I think it's it's sad. But I just think we need to have town meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, naturally, I'm an old stick in the mud, so I think the most efficient, nicest thing to do is just have uh, Charlie Dagener prosper. Uh, so naturally, I think the nicest thing to do is just have everybody stop what they're doing for one day, assemble, uh, decide the issues, vote and move on. But I know that we've moved beyond that and that's not what we do anymore. So I think Woodstock's in a unique position because we have come to a good compromise. Uh, we've retained some of these vestiges of what makes Vermont unique and what builds community. And we've also adapted to some of the modern <clears throat> uh, ways. So, for instance, in the recap that Laura gave you, since 1958, we've voted for our officers by Australian ballot. That was the first concession that we made. We've moved around when we have town meeting. It always used to be the first Tuesday in March. Uh, but we decided at some point that that was no longer working, so we moved it to a Monday night. We did that for a period of time, and uh, people didn't like that, so we went back to Tuesday, and then people thought maybe we would get a broader uh, appeal if we moved to Saturday. So that's where we've arrived at the Saturday town meeting. I think the other unique thing that we have to our advantage in Woodstock that many towns don't, in 1982, we passed... Uh, a mandate that all petitioned articles are to be voted by Australian ballots. So if that puts us in a unique position, um, when voters have some issue that they feel they're particularly interested in, they can get 150 signatures and they can uh, mandate that the select board hears that issue and deals with it. And it's going to be by Australian ballot. It's not from the floor. Likewise, the select, it gives the select board more latitude. Um, you know, under the normal methods, everything has to be from the floor, or you vote as Laura's proposing tonight to do everything by Australian ballot. But the select board in Woodstock has the unique latitude that our default is from the floor. But if you decide that you've got an issue that you want to vote by Australian ballot, like anybody else, you can circulate a petition and have that article decided by Australian ballot. And a few years ago, the select board decided, I believe if I remember correctly, it was the full-time EMS fire department, that that was something that should be voted by Australian ballot. So they took the initiative to get the signatures and put it on the Australian ballot. So I think it's unfortunate to throw away 250 years worth of progress. Uh, my primary concern is that we're doing it in an un underhanded way. We're not putting it forth to the voters, but we're unilaterally deciding that we're going to vote by Australian ballot and it's going to be through an emergency measure that apparently okay. most towns- Nobody's decided that. No, but that's the potential, Ray, and that's my concern. But you're saying we decided. No, what my concern is, is that potentially the five select board members could decide that we will be voting by Australian ballot. And that is a concern of mine, especially when uh, it doesn't appear that we're in the sort of pandemic that we were last year, and I'm not sure that we need to invoke the emergency measures to do it for one year. So. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Lara online has a question. Lisa, are you there? Yeah, hi, I'm here. Um, my finger is usually is over the key. Um, 
I did want to mention there's a certain percentage of people who are unable to attend the town meeting. One of them is myself. Um, and it's not that we don't want to, it's just that we're not able to. And I think it's important that we always consider that the populace, that the most number of people can make informed choices about the no most number of items. And so I'd like to see the opportunity from all of you to, we need to recognize that not everyone can go to town meeting, but the people who can't go to town meeting want a voice in the system. And so we need to remember that, that we can't just assume that people who don't go to town meeting don't go because they don't want to and they don't want to vote during town meetings. So this emergency uh, vote situation allows me as a voter here to vote in something that I would not be able to vote in if there was a town meeting day. And that's all that I want to say is that every citizen should have the ability to vote in as many things as they want to, regardless of whether or not they can attend something like a town meeting. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll so there's no more comments no more comments. No more in the room. Okay. Oh. Oh. Uh, David Green of here in Woodstock. Um, so I heard some great comments from both sides. Uh, my biggest comment is, if we go Australian ballot, are we getting all the voters still? We're not. We're getting more voters. <clears throat> and I think to lose our sense of, sense of community by not having our town meeting day and discuss these votes in person, make a difference, rather than just sending in a ballot is a bad idea. Um, I would love to have 3,162 voters either way, but I think what we do now is the best and and to uh, continue it that way would be the, the greatest thing for Woodstock. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Yeah. Eric, can I ask Charlie a clarifying question about something uh, he said? Yes. Um, Charlie, I just want to mirror back to you what you said about having um, the select board vote that special articles could be on the Australian ballot. What's your question, Laura? So <laughs> I I was unaware that's an option. So I wanted to clarify that that is an option. What you're saying is that the select board could vote to put special articles on Australian ballot. The select board, just like any other resident of Woodstock, can circulate a petition. And if they get the required number of signatures, that article will be on the Australian ballot. So, okay. What you're offering is essentially so like- it, it is more laborious than just voting something from the floor. But if the select board thinks that an issue should be handled by Australian ballot, they have the latitude to circulate a petition, get the required number of signatures, and that article is voted by Australian ballot. And that method has been used at least once in recent years that I can think of, and I'm sure many times over the years. And there's no limit to how many special articles could be petitioned in that vein, I guess, is, is, is a question. Not to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your help with all of this. I appreciate it. Charlie has an encyclopedic knowledge, if anybody didn't know. Yeah. I just, Wendy Marinin, village resident, um, speaking to the options of how to vote, the converse is also true. My understanding, also explained to me by Charlie in the, as a town clerk, that if there's a, a question of comfort in the town hall meeting, a, a person with the support of six others could request on the floor for a paper ballot. And uh, then a per paper ballot, ballot can be circulated at town meeting day. That would allow <clears throat> us people to feel better about speaking their mind in confidence in a vote in a confidential voting pattern. 
So um, that was revealed to me as a, as a converse option to the Australian ballot that's a feature of town meeting day currently. And I just wanted to bring that to the discussion. So I don't know if the board wants them to take any action tonight or not. Uh, it's up to the board. I guess I'll just, I'll say where I'm at right now, which is that I, I'm going to summarize my thoughts since I've been, been working on this document, which is that I think that um, I have, I have many thoughts about this and at many times I thought I could be swayed either way, to be honest. Um, I think there are many good arguments for and against. Um, I think what uh, matters to me most is that we make voting as accessible as possible. Um, and I, I believe that that trumps what our idea is of an informed voter. I think it's not up to us to decide what makes an informed voter. Um, I think we could absolutely do better to Jill's point. Um, and I think that's something we should absolutely always be striving for. Uh, I worry that we are holding on to this tradition um, and and unknowingly excluding many people from this. I spoke to many people over the past two weeks who said that they've never voted, who would they would vote if we, you know, moved to Australia ballot. They've never been to town meeting. Um, I think this is something that made sense when everybody lived and worked in the same town. Um, uh, and uh, we don't anymore. We have we have many employees from who work for our town that don't even live in our town who we have to ask to be here on our town meeting day and cannot participate in their own town meeting days. We have um, people who work on Saturdays. So many more people are working now um, in a non-traditional nine to five schedule and are unable um, to not only not get the day off, um, but to get childcare and coverage. Um, and I, and I worry about that. Um, I am, you know, I would have I would have loved to have had time to have a special town meeting before this to decide this and let the public decide this. Um, and so for that, I feel, yeah, I don't know, but I do know that COVID is still real as evidenced by the fact that there are so many people here online, um, like myself that have COVID. Um, and I also know that we cannot predict what the weather will be next year. Um, and I think in an ideal world, I would love to see us move one way or another, either like to full town meeting or to full ballot. We cannot move to full town meeting given how many things we are required to have on town ballot. Um, and, you know, I think there's just many new ways that we need to find to connect with our community um, and to inform. And so I would be in favor of, of making a motion to apply act one for Australian ballot with the intention of having a special town meeting after our town meeting to see if this is a permanent change that the town want to apply, wants to apply. Um, that's that's where I'm at, but I, I wanted to kind of explain my reasoning and where I'm at. Thank you. So, I, I, uh, I think Carrie's uh, got her hand up. Carrie, yeah. Do you have your hand up? You're muted. Yes, I just, I, you know, I think, of course, town meeting day is very charming, but I mean, listen to what we're saying. We have a vehicle for education of voters and voting that only has the capacity for a tenth of our voters. Um, it's just not equitable. We're not even allowing people to call in and vote over Zoom. Um, so I think if you're if we're really being honest, and we really want people to get out and vote and participate, then we have to make sure all of our forums, be they in-person voting, be they town meeting, it can at least accommodate the people we say we want to attend. So I just want to, did Laura make a motion? Laura, did you make an actual motion? Which are you? I didn't make a motion, but I'm happy to. I said, I, if okay. other board Sorry, members wanted to chime in, I said I would be happy to make the motion. Okay. I, so but I'm, I'm sure for is your motion to well so, so she didn't make a motion so no but she said she would make a motion okay. if other people you know she would happen to make the motion i'm I, intending I, to make the motion yeah I, <laughs> yeah that verb usage is very difficult for us tonight 
I, think, I just, I um, think it's important to explain my reasoning. And, you know, yeah. I'm accountable to the people in this room. <laughs> I, I agree because um, I've been at town, every town meeting since I've moved here and the crowds get less and less. Um, and I, I'm, I'd be in favor of having a special article uh, on this year's ballot to have. So I think we're talking two different things right now. So Laura's talking about uh, using Title I to make this town meeting all Australian ballots. So what Laura was suggesting was uh, potentially having a motion to make this town meeting in March all Australian ballot following the COVID rules, and then potentially having a special town meeting later where the discussion would be to switch to full Australian ballots going forward. Correct, right. Laura? Yeah, yeah, but it sounds like Ray's making a, a different suggestion, which is fine. Uh, I, I, I wasn't sure what you were. Yeah, sorry. I was saying that I would vote to apply for Act 1 for this town meeting with the intent of having a special public meeting afterwards because we would need to, to permanently change it. We cannot permanently change it under Act 1. We can only change it for this year. Sorry. I don't by know what date do, do um, but Charlie, do you know, or someone in the room know, by what date absentee ballots have to be postmarked to be valid? In Vermont, all ballots have to be received by the close of polls. So they would have to be received, received by physically by 7 o'clock on the election day. Great. So in theory, if we did an informational meeting two Saturdays before, then people would still have time to mail in ballots if they wanted to attend the meeting for information. Correct. Prior to voting. Yeah. I, I just want to say, I think that the, the town needs to vote on it. I think it needs to be brought up at the meeting and voted at the meeting and go from there. So uh, which needs to be voted on? The yeah, permanent change? Right, permanent change. Yeah, so it has to be. Okay. So the permanent change will have to be either on on the floor at town meeting, if nothing, if we're following normal guidelines, or if we're doing Australian ballot for this town meeting, it would have to be its own separate town meeting afterwards, where that would be the one topic on on, but, on, the, on the on the ballot. Greg, are you saying you're not comfortable with the five of us making that decision? Correct. I, I think the town should make this decision somehow. It's for this wrong, town wrong, meeting, wrong. or for permanently? Permanently. Permanently. So yes. so yes, yes. So they will. We so, all agree that. Yeah, so the select board has the power to make this town meeting Australian ballot. Only this town meeting following the state guidelines for COVID. So they can decide, you guys can decide to do that or not do that. To do anything beyond that, so the town meeting in 2025, to make any changes to that, that will have to be a special town meeting where the residents of the town would come and vote one way or the other. So any permit change will be done by, by the residents. The Discussion about 2024 when using Title One that Laura's talking about can be made by the select board. You have, you have the power on this, this current state statute to make that decision. But should we? I just, I, I just clarify something. Um, it was my understanding that if you don't invoke Title One, that because of the discovery of of a of a a, a select board a decision when sometime. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, Roger. I think you missed one meeting and, and the three off. So basically, we we are under the assumption that there was a change made in 1981 or 82 that made um, petition ballots supposed to go back to the floor. Right. We found later that that change did not happen. Okay. So very okay. I must have. Yeah. Okay. So ignore my question. Sorry. Mark Warrington again. Laura and I had spoken about. I'd be glad to stand if a petition. I'll be glad to stand in front of the post office for the next two weeks and get 150 signatures. But she wasn't sure if that was going to be allowed, that it would actually go on the ballot for this. We could still get on. But she also said something. There was a 47-day rule. Charlie would know about that. to get. In other words, we'd have to get these signatures to whoever gets them by January 17th or 18th, depending on where you're counting back from. Yeah. I don't know if that's a really good idea. I mean, I could do it if you wanted, but I think having a special meeting would be a better way to do it and people have more time. 
but I would hope the board would vote on something for the temporary because my understanding of reading the law is this act, is it act one? Expires in July of 2024. Thank you. Sure, Wendy. Wendy Marin, and my observation is there are really two big decisions here about the town meeting and voting, and they're separate. Yes. And one of them is, do we have the urgency to, for public health right now to make the decision to use Act 1? That's a decision, period. Period. What I'm afraid of is that we would use this. I'm afraid of seeing the implementation so we could show everybody how great it is without town meeting. That bothers me that 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 this decision would be connected to another decision. I see them as they should be handled very separately. Can I respond to Wendy? Sure. And then we'll then then if you want to make the motion. Yeah. No, I think I think that's a good point. I will say that I I don't think it's anybody's intention to show. I think that's already been evidenced by our um, full Australian ballots during 2001 and 2002. We had incredible high. We had high voter turnout the years that we voted remotely during COVID. Um, and so I I. Yeah, that's what I'll say about that. I think, um, I think, I think COVID is still a concern. I think that um, <laughs> we have no idea <laughs> what will happen in the next two months. Um, but I, yeah. So, um, I don't know if the board wants to take a vote. We need a motion. I will make a motion for the select board to apply Act One to fully apply Australian ballot to town meeting twenty twenty two. 2024. 2024. 2024. 2024. Thank you, Eric. Is there a second? I'll second. All I'll second. Carry seconds. All Aye. in favor? Aye. 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 Discussion? It's the same. Wait, the discussion by the public is closed once there's a motion. Yeah. 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 There was discussion. Okay. So in doing this, it's just for this one year, correct? And then it, and then it goes to vote to the town. So no, so exactly. that, the 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 select board would have to then call a special town meeting if they wanted to do this for future years. So right. the the motion in front of you is to uh, put Act One for twenty twenty four town meeting all Australian ballots. That will expire in July of twenty twenty four. If it's the select board's desire to have the future town meetings be on Australian ballots. You'd have to call a special meeting, special town meeting, and have that vote then. So, in other words, it's a one-year trial, and then people vote on it after that. If that's what you want to raise it, yes. Is that a fair assumption? Or well, it I don't know that I would categorize it as a trial, but I would say that we're trying to expand accessibility, and this is an avenue we're using to do that. Greg, every any permanent change needs to come before the public. But we're using a COVID emergency measure to do it. Yeah. Which, yeah. And I, I want to point out that cannabis was on the ballot in 2022. So I think that was responsible for a lot of the Australian ballot turnout. More discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. Have it. Thank you. Moving on. 1% sales tax. This is me again. Yeah. Let me share my screen. Can everybody see it? 
So, Flora, before we start, can I just get clarification? So, because there's people in the room online, is this just to give another overview, or are you asking, is the end result of this to have the board potentially uh, vote to have this on the ballot in uh, town meeting day? My understanding and my goal is to have a vote. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, this is a document that I put together for a local option sales tax. Um, for those of you that want some background, um, in 2022, we put uh, the select board at the time put forward a special article to implement a local options tax, um, which was defeated by a small margin. Um, since then, the select board has been um, talking about our um, about the possibility of including it um, on the ballot at town meeting. Um, since 2015, we have collected a local options tax applied to meal, lodging, and alcohol um, that our local businesses remit to the state. Um, that state, the state holds 30%, and then the 70% is what funds our Economic Development Commission. Um, we have discussed using this tax as one of the few levers available to us to raise revenue, um, uh, um, which we care about now that we are facing um, increasing infrastructure expenses, as I'm sure we are all acutely aware. Um, uh, local options tax is one of the few ways that we can share the burden of operating costs with people who um, don't live and pay taxes in this town. So um, I put a proposed article together. Um, I will have to work with Charlie on the wording. It might be to see, it might be shall. Um, but uh, the idea would be that we would um, add a 1% local option sales tax in accordance with the Vermont statute 138 with proceeds to be allocated to infrastructure costs. Um, so one of the definitions that I found for infrastructure is um, physical and organizational structures and facilities that are owned, operated, or managed by local governments or municipalities to support the functioning of a, I'll just say, municipality. Um, this can include a lot of different things, um, but I think this also includes very obvious things um, like the maintenance of our municipal buildings, um, maintenance and care of our roads, sidewalks. It also could include digital tools to provide services to residents like a website um, or online software that makes certain things and certain government functions easier. Um, water supply and distribution systems, very topical, and wastewater treatment plants. Again, these are just a few examples. Um, as uh, we know from our previous discussion, the select board has to approve by vote any expenditure with the revenue um, that this tax brings in. And um, we could um, spend it in a way that's guided by goals and priorities, um, which is another thing that we've talked about doing um, or that the select board has talked about doing after town meeting day um, as a part of our reorg is setting priorities. Um, and then uh, using it as a legislative agenda, uh, uh, if you will. Um, so this is something that um, could be guided by that. Um, some background, some FAQ. Um, what would a local option sales tax apply to? Um, this can get very confusing because I think a lot of people hear sales tax and they think it it's like all sales tax as a sales tax. Um, this is a very specific sales tax, the local option sales tax. Um, so like any transactions that are currently subject to Vermont state sales tax, which is 6%, um, would be subject to the local options uh, tax. Um, so it also applies to, um, I found out today, online sales um, because it is destination-based. So wherever the purchaser takes possession of the item, um, that is where the tax gets applied. Um, the tax is collected from the buyer at the time of sale and remitted to the state. Um, and as I mentioned, the town would receive 70% of that remittance as the state collects 30% of it for their pilot fund. Um, there is 
vast amounts that are uh, of items that are exempt from the local options tax, um, including but not limited to, um, and I'll just bring up this document, but it's linked in my thing, um, clothing, lots of clothing items, over-the-counter drugs, um, food with the exception of alcohol and soft drinks, um, and medical equipment, menstrual care pro products, um, et cetera. So that's like a very helpful um, document to um, reference. And now I've got to find my tabs, sorry. Um, so a lot of clothing and necessities, like I said, are exempt from the, the uh, sales tax. Um, a lot of communities in Vermont have imposed a local option sales tax. Um, they're all listed at this link below, but 22 other towns have this local option sales tax specifically. Um, and uh, neighboring states have similar towns rates, of course, with the exception of New Hampshire, which we know does not have any sales tax. Rhode Island is seven. The average New York tax rate is eight and a quarter percent. That's because um, New York sets a base rate and then counties set their own um, local options tax on top of that. But the average is eight and a quarter. Massachusetts is six and a quarter and Connecticut is 6.35. And we currently rank 35th in the U.S. for sales tax. Um, and this could be implemented um, as soon as 90 days after, if it were to pass, um, the Department of Taxes just requires that time, uh, lead time to um, communicate with businesses about collecting the tax. So um, yeah, that's uh, the that's kind of the information that I put together. Um, I don't know if the board has any questions about any of this material I can hope to answer. I don't, I don't. Any public comments? Uh, Jeffrey Tom, Village resident. Um, the comment on, uh, two comments. One is not mine, it's Nick Farrow's. He had to leave. He asked me if I could just read this, and he's a village resident also. So, then three minutes. I, I can do it in three minutes. Okay. Yeah, this is Nick Farrow. Okay. Once again, a local option tax is being discussed to be placed on uh, merchant sales in Woodstock. Fuel oil delivered to all commercial properties in Woodstock would also be charged the additional 1%. Building owners will pass this increase on to the merchants, so we'd be forced to pass it on to their customers. 40 to 50% of merchant sales for my store, that's NT Ferro, and other shops in Woodstock come from local residents. While the rules and meals tax, which is predominantly paid by visitors, and goes to the EDC to help the town in, in many ways. This, this tax paid mostly by residents will go to the, can't read it, so it will go to the town. All commercial building owners will be paying 1% on fuel oil use in Woodstock. I think the EDC is doing a fine job and can't see how this tax helps the merchants or residents of Woodstock. This tax already was rejected twice in the past by residents. The last time it was the only article. Rejected. So that's what he has to say. Then I'll, I'll say something on my own separately that uh, I'd just like to say as a village trustee, and Eric is aware of this, uh, just bringing up the point that um, the select board has to consider whether it would be necessary for the village to vote separately on this. There are certain things that have occurred in the past, um, such as the numbering system for our houses. The town took, voted to create a certain numbering system or accept a certain numbering system. The village voted to opt out, and that was legal and accepted. Uh, the town voted to allow dispensaries in, in, in the town of Woodstock. The village voted to opt out and not allow dispensaries. So right now, uh, that's a question that I think needs to be known. And I think the lawyers are being worked uh, working on this. Correct, Eric? Yes. So until that's known, I don't think you can really do much of anything in terms of making a, a broad decision. 
Thank you. Thanks. So as we all know, we are facing massive infrastructure spending over the next probably decades. <laughs> if that matters to some of us, I don't know. Um, we need to find revenue and we need to find revenue in a way that has the least impact on taxpayers. Um, I'm not sure that that we actually have the data to say that 40% or in any particular percent of of spending in in a retail spending in the in the town is x amount this the x amount non non residents and x amount residents I don't think we have that data um obviously we need to be looking at it but the fact that food is exempt the fact that a lot of necessities are exempt it's 1% if you're going to drive to west lebanon to buy a $40 can of paint because you don't want to spend 40 cents, then I think you need to look at your economics a little more carefully. <laughs> so we need to develop revenue sources. We need to be as creative as possible about developing revenue sources. And this is not an onerous, a 1% addition to the sales tax is not onerous. It might perhaps be if it was food or, or, or drugs or something else. But, and Laura, could you just, could you clarify the that this also includes online sales if the recipient is in Vermont? Yeah, so if the recipient Woodstock, right, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, if the recipient is in Woodstock, they are uh they the 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 um online retailer is responsible for remitting tax if they meet two criteria, which is that in a 12-month period they'll do an access of $100,000 in sales or 200 transactions, whichever. An excess of $100,000. $100,000 in sales or 200 transactions. I mean, in total or, or to Woodstock residents? In well, total, in total, not to so Woodstock. That is potentially a gigantic revenue source. I mean, if, if every Amazon transaction that's shipped to somebody in Woodstock, we can stop paying taxes. <laughs> Um, you know, I think we really need to consider this, especially, I had no idea that that was the case. Um, yep. So the case is, uh, this is a new thing as of 2018. It's a court case that went before the Supreme Court, Wayfair versus South Dakota, um, that paved the way for um, online retailers to collect local options tax. Um, so it's new-ish. Um, but it's definitely something that I don't think came up in a lot of the conversation before about local options tax. Um, and to Jeffrey's point about excluding the village would also then mean that village residents would be excluded from, from paying that tax. Um, but town residents might have to. Right. Okay. So that's for the lawyers to decide, but, but I think we would be remiss in not, in not making a decision to go ahead with this. Thank you. I just want to clarify something. Um, what, what I brought up as a village trustee, I don't know how the village would vote. They might be all in favor of this. I'm just saying that they should have the option based on how things have worked in the past to make a decision as a municipality. Thank you. John Spector has his hand up. Wendy, and then, uh, John, we have Wendy, then you will go, go to you. Thank you. Um, I, Wendy Marin and village resident. I want to thank the select board and the village trustees. I raised this question for consideration a few meetings ago um, as a possible resource for increased revenue to be brought to the voters. Um, so I am in support of it. And I think that the EDC results, the one local uh, rooms and meals tax is evidence that it becomes a source of revenue of significance. It is not going to change my personal shopping habits as a village resident who believes in local to stop shopping in Woodstock. So uh, I want to thank both both entities for considering this at the very least. Thank you. Uh, John, then Charlie. Go on. I have a quick question for Laura. If we were to vote this in, and then it was found, which I don't think it would, to be 
huge, significantly negatively impacting a majority of merchants, could we unvote it in a mm -hmm. subsequent year? Yeah, I think that's a probably more of a question for Charlie the clerk, but I'm sure any any petition measure can come before the board, uh, before the voters. Is that is that your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would think that it could. Is there any? I would think that it could be. I'm just sort of checking. If if, if that's the case, I, I understand. I think it's important to respect the concern that any business owner would have that adding on a tax to their customers. And I'm glad no one has said that the business owners pay this tax. Um, they don't, but their customers do. And I can understand the concern that any business owner would have about their customers having to pay a tax. Having said that, I don't think there was much, if there was no measurable effect, as far as I can tell, um, with Woodstock uh, putting in the options tax that funds the EDC. I don't think it would not change my behavior, same as Wendy. And um, I don't think it would change other people's behavior in getting. So for all the reasons cited, I think it would uh, I would support approving this now. I would vote for it. But I, I would say that that it is important. If there was significant damage, I would hope I would be the first to bring up, you know, the possibility that we should vote it out in the future. It seems to me it's absolutely something, given the circumstance now, that we should try. And it's not doesn't have to be permanent. Thank you. Go we'll to Charlie online, then Jill, and then Greta. Anecdotally, I had the wood stuck in. I was just going to say anecdotally, I have the, the Blue Horse in when the MR percent tax was passed and they're right. weeping. Carrie, you're you know, breaking up a little bit. Gnashing yeah. of teeth and noticed by customers and clients. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, a little bit. Not close. Night for us. All right. Yeah. Why don't we have Jill come up and carry. All right. Can... Who, 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 Charlie, do you want to go? Then we'll get Jill. Okay. Sure, just, a, just a quick perspective from historical when the local options tax was passed uh, for rooms, meals, and alcohol. It was passed by the town without a separate vote by the village and it was subject to all businesses located within the town, uh, including the village. The other is that uh, in Recent history, there has been an example where a sales tax has been repealed by a community that was the town of Kellington. Uh, when the resort objected to collecting and remitting those taxes uh, and said, hey, we'll spend the same amount on marketing. So the town uh, reversed that decision. So they do not have a sales tax in Killington anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Kara, do you want to try to say what you want to say? Okay. <laughs> um, Go, Jill. I wanted to ask a point of clarification about what was read. Did you say that um, the commercial buildings are going to be taxed with fuel? Their fuel is going to be taxed as commercial owners? I, 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 that was a letter that, that Jeffrey Conner Right, wrote. and I question the validity of that information. <laughs> Laura, is fuel oil an exempted product? Um, I, I don't have that information. I'm happy to look it up, but I don't, I don't, I would, yeah, I don't, I don't know. That I was the case. Up. Up. Is that Charlie? Yeah. That was the case in Killington, that all the fuel oil sales to Killington Mountain Resort were taxed under the 1% local options tax. Thank you. Uh, Greta online. Hi, yes, I have a quick comment and also a question. My comment is in response to Mr. Farrow's um, uh, comment that Jeffrey read and you know, he's correct that this will likely affect the local community more so than the existing 1% options tax. But at the same time, these infrastructure costs are already our burden 100%. And so this is, like Laura's document said, our, op our you know, this is our opportunity to be able to share those costs with some visitors. And then um, my question is on items, for instance, alcohol. 
um, on the receipt, will it have two different line items for the 1% taxes? Yes, it should have, it should have different line items. So like it wouldn't, I, I would need to confirm with the Department of State taxes um, because we know, and I'm sure you know on the EDC, they don't love to give us itemized versions of everything. And maybe Charlie has experience with this, but I it's my understanding seeing as alcohol would be doubly taxed um, that or or triply taxed, I guess, that it would it would be separate line items for each tax. Uh, just sorry. Uh, yeah, the rooms, meals and alcohol taxes are not double dip. So you don't, don't get a sale tax on alcohol sales. OK, yeah, it's so only if you don't have the alcohol, the meals, lodging and alcohol tax. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's what 10% alcohol tax, so you get 1% on the addition of that, right? Yep, we're not sure about alcohol. Yeah. I can say what Carrie was. Oh, yeah, please, saying. yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> she um wanted to say that anecdotally, a word I always struggle with, when she owned the blue horse, um, the meals the 1% was passed on rooms and meals. She said there was much weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth by. The larger hospitality community, but the increase went unnoticed by the guests who were paying the extra one percent. And she adds, "Try to get a room in Woodstock during most weekends these days." And I will add to that that I work retail, and granted, my where I work is largely a, a tourist population, but no one asks what the tax is. And if they do, and I tell them, they're like, "Wow, that that's lower than where I live." So mm -hmm. I I don't see it having an impact. And you know, today we've talked about ten million dollars in capital for the water. Or I know we've talked about fourteen million for town hall. Who knows for the main wastewater plant? We have the Route Twelve bridge coming up, and whatever other road projects we're going to have. And there's just so much that taxpayers can pay for all these capital plan plans. Okay. Any other comments? I just looked it up on the website to go back to Jill's question and the uh, commercial fuel for or fuel for commercial businesses is um, not exempt from the 1% local option sales tax. At least that's how I'm reading it, but I'm going to confirm with the uh, tax commissioner. Want to. Um... Make a, make a motion on this tonight or? Yeah, well, okay. it's kind of on the ballot. Yeah. So is there a motion? I'll make the motion that we include an article to be done by Australian ballot, um, which I guess now that's moot, it's all yeah. Australian ballot, to include a 1% sales tax, um, roughly the language that Laura proposed, that the 1% would be restricted to structure. And I guess I did have one quick question whether infrastructure could also include bond repayment. So if there was a year where we didn't really have a lot of infrastructure needs, could we reduce taxes by putting some of that like on the wastewater bond or something like that? Yeah, I think we'd probably flush out the terminology for uh, the ballot, but yeah. Yeah, okay. I think that would be important. So. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. make a second. Oh, sorry. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Other business? Okay. Um, we want to go into executive session. Yes, we have a motion and vote for executive session. Is there a motion to go into executive session? I make the motion we go into executive discussion. Is there a second? No. A second. All those in favor? Hi. Thank you. It is to discuss it's negotiations. Good discussions. Yeah. And have fun in the executive yeah. session. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Roger. Mark, do we need to say who Jill is saying? Should I have stated why we were going to? Yeah, you're pretty session? sure, yeah. So I'll amend my motion to say we're going into executive session to discuss. Negotiations? Yes. Real estate negotiations. Hopefully, Nikki's got that one. 
well, when, didn't go into executive session. Well, when, when we'll get the minutes, we just change it. Yeah. Do we need we need to be in a breakout room, right? 